The story on this build isn't necessarily about a Beretta, an LS swap, or a body swap. It's really about all of it and how it was put together outside. And absolutely none of that is easy. But the point of this isn't to turn this into a boring technical documentary. It's just to give you a decent rundown of why I did it and how I did it. And hopefully it'll be inspirational to somebody else who wants to build something crazy. Because you don't need a garage. Not if you truly want something. Let me start off by explaining what this car was. It's a 1989 Chevy Beretta with a four-cylinder base model. It had 200,000 miles, at least close to that, with nothing but a bunch of hail damage. Just completely clapped out. Since I've owned it, I installed a four-wheel drive frame where there was not one before. The four-wheel drive is actually legit. And it has an LS engine sticking out of the hood like something you'd see out of Mad Max. And believe it or not, people dig that. Either way, going into why I did this in the first place, a good portion of it, honestly, it was COVID. I got sick and tired of what was going on in the world, and I did not care to even participate. And I just figured I'd just give myself a project and keep my nose to the grindstone and just, just do something that wasn't going to make me think about what's going on in the world. This is where the Beretta comes into play, because the Beretta needed a motor. I, I originally bought this car as a commuter car. Um, and I did. I used it as a commuter car. I, I had this ridiculous drive to go to work. It was about 160 miles a day. And I put about, like I said, 30,000 miles on this car before the head, gar head gasket started failing in it. And it needed something, and I needed something to do. I also don't want to forget to mention that this is a pretty nostalgic car for me. I grew up driving these types of cars, either Cavaliers or Berettas or, or whatever. And it, they there was a lot of points in my life where I found myself behind the wheel of one of these things and the thing is is that you don't find these anymore um not to mention parts which is a whole nother issue either way I didn't want to get rid of this thing and I needed I knew I needed to do something with the availability of parts and then I also needed to to, to get rid of the front wheel drive I can't stand that stuff so in the back of my mind I'm, I'm beginning to realize I'm going to have to do some kind of a body swap but that presents me with an entirely different issue. I don't have a garage. I don't even have a slab to work on. How am I going to even attempt to pick up a car and, and, and put it on another one and, and try to figure this all out? I, but it's the only option I have because I'm not, I can't just sit there and re-engineer an entire car. Either way, I didn't try to catastrophize about the entire situation. I just basically just went straight to the internet and started researching any kind of redneck deal about picking up cars or anything like that i mean i've always seen like some certain situations with people picking up like the cab of a truck with like an engine hoist but never an entire car either way that's where i started researching and then i started getting ballsy during covid there wasn't really much to do it was either go go to work or go home and i started getting to a point where I didn't even care. I knew I was going to do some kind of a project, but I needed something to work on. So I went out into the front yard and I started making a slab. Ah, uh, and there it is, folks. Hand dug with only the finest gardening tools with extreme precision so I can carry out my automotive surgery on a defenseless little Beretta. So this area may have started out that way. And this is actually two years after, just about two years after the project but it's still here but the convenient situation that actually helped me out in the ending is that the girlfriend wanted to get her driveway done so she hired a contractor to come out here with a skid steer and level out her driveway and then in the time being he he noticed what i was doing and he was like dude i like what you're doing this is cool as hell just let me know what you want done with this area i'll level it out for you so you can continue your project the guy was like super cool and as you can see there was a reason I needed to have some kind of a slab because there's nothing level on this property. So fast forward into the situation where I end up doing nothing but a bunch of online research, figuring out wheelbase sizes and buying this blazer. I paid about $900 for this thing. It had 140,000 miles on it. It did have an engine issue, but it ran. After investigating the 
engine issue, I, I come to find that the only thing the thing needed was a cap and rotor. So we're thinking 40, 50 bucks. Uh, so I just scored a $900 blazer uh, that needed $50 worth of work, which is a, th that's a great situation because I have a completely decent running vehicle for 950 bucks. At worst case scenario, all I got to do is, is just basically flip this blazer and I got my money back. It's, it's that simple. And this dude swore up and down I had a fuel injection issue, but at the time I didn't really care because I was not interested in having a 4.3 in this project. Another funny scenario about this blazer is that it came with two beers in the back. Um, I guess they use this for an old hunting blazer. I found all kinds of like, you know, like ammo and, you know, brass in the back of it and a couple beers and stuff like that. Either way, I saved these beers because I had a conversation with this guy and basically I told him what I was going to do with it. He immediately thought I was insane. Maybe not really insane, but he had the impression that I was going to turn it into a rock crawler or, or some kind of a project, not to cut it up and, and basically turn my car into some weird contraption. Either way, I saved these beers and then I sent him pictures and I was like, hey man, thank you for the beers. The project's done. <laughs> and he was totally cool about it. So here's a fun fact about the situation, why this project turned into a four-wheel drive project. Finding a four-door blazer in Colorado that's actually a two-wheel drive, it's it doesn't really exist. So I ended up picking up this, you know, four-wheel drive for cheap, not being able to find a two-wheel drive. And I was like, you know what? Screw it. What's the worst that's going to happen? Then later after I thought about it, I started getting super excited because I was like, dude, I don't think anyone has ever done that. At least not how I was planning on doing it. And that's where I started getting extremely passionate and extremely excited about getting this done. So this is where the project lived for a couple of months. I started it in late 2020. I began by lightly stripping the blazer down, basically taking measurements of everything I possibly can to figure out whether or not if I was going to be able to pull off this crazy body swap. Something that was very important at the time was parts management. Because if this wasn't going to work, as long as I didn't cut into these vehicles, I could potentially put them back together and use them for something else. So what I ended up effectively doing is stashing them in that rickety little shed that you see in the pictures and keeping everything as organized as I possibly could. Moving on to what I thought was one of the more important things that was needed for this project is, is getting a set of tires. Uh, and these tires were as close as a match as I could find um, that would be equal to the Beretta and the rims would be matching to the hub size of the Blazer. These wheels were super cheap and the, the tires were cheap too because they're kind of, they're, they kind of suck. But Either way, I knew it was going to work for the project, and when I put them on the blazer, it actually made it look so stupid. I started calling this thing the boner because it's a blazer and it's a donor vehicle, so it's a boner. Shut up. I'm funny, and you know it. The second thing I bought for this was the HP tuners and getting myself set up for it. Even though I didn't want the 4.3 in there, I figured, well, might as well still use the 4.3 as, a, as a, a test mule for the entire project. So I just left it in there and I got the 4.3 set up with HP tuners. This is why the project was held up for a couple of months. I was fighting the cold and the elements, but it really wasn't that big of a deal because there was a lot of planning that needed to be put in place. Colorado for you. It wasn't until April of 2021 where the weather really started to break and I was actually able to tear into these cars even more, investigating and measuring more and more things as I go, looking for anything that was going to basically put me in a position where I could not do this project. At this point, the Blazer does not run. The Beretta still does, but the Blazer, it, there's really no point. I've, I've removed too many front-end components and we've already had the contractor officially come in and, and level out this work slab, so there's really no reason for it to be running anymore. We've come to a new chapter, folks. I've taken all the measurements I can. I've done all the research I can. I'm going to have to attempt to pick up the body of the Blazer and move it with two engine hoists in the dirt. I've never been able to confirm whether or not this has even been attempted before. If this does not work, I'm putting these cars back together with my tail between my legs. One of the most liberating feelings I've had since this project began, I was able to adapt and overcome the situations I put myself in. As crazy as this looked to somebody who might have been watching from afar, 
accomplishing this crazy stunt gave me more motivation than I ever needed to complete this project. And come to find out, people were watching. And the funny thing is no one was upset. They were actually entertained by what I was doing. And I found myself with a neighborhood audience. All right, so people may be asking, how long did that actually take to take that body off? And what did you do when you actually ran out of plywood? To answer that first question, it takes about four hours, and that's to get it on and off. Not off, on, back off, and then back on, whatever you want to call it. It's just one shot getting the body off with plywood and two engine hoists. When I did run out of plywood, that's where it did get complicated, and I had to go recruit the biggest hammer in my toolbox inventory. And basically, I had to tap on the wood to push the wood over, and then after the wood was moved a couple of inches, I would move the engine hoist over. The best way to describe this is the old tablecloth trick when you whip the tablecloth off and you got all your items still standing on your table. For example. Ta-da! All right, so hopefully that's out of the way. So as of this point, I got my frame. I got the body ready for the chopping block with everything exposed. It's not hiding anything from me. What was clear to me at this point is that I needed to get this thing running again without the body just to make sure I didn't break anything when I removed the body off of the frame. So I'm not going to get into this too far. I basically took weeks and weeks going through this entire body harness, engine harness, and turning it into a mini engine harness um, just to make sure that this thing ran. Next on the list is the Beretta. I got to get the motor out of it and get it stripped down as much as I can so I can see everything as well. It's not going to hide anything from me. I will be able to measure anything I possibly can before I start cutting. This is it. This is the last time she's going to be running. So let's not have a moment of silence for the death of a Chevy Beretta. Let's have a moment of silence for the death of a four-cylinder front-wheel drive. <laughs> Jeffrey, why are we at the stupid yeah. girl? This Dude, this is so stupid. Who the hell cares about stupid four-cylinder? Oh, glad that was quick. Well, time to bury it. I got a boat anchor I gotta move. I can't move it because I do projects outside like a retard and I don't have a shop. Let's see how this goes. Well, I tipped over in the street. <laughs> Glad I'm not using it anymore. Oh yeah, nice chewed up road. Moving on. So I've been staring at these cars for weeks, months, uh, you know, whatever. I've, I've, I had a good general idea of where everything was gonna go when it comes to like the brakes or the steering column, anything like that. But I wasn't for sure, for sure. I had to tear these cars down to this point to actually put in dotted line, little cut marks and, and move forward with what I was doing. In this scenario, I ended up actually chopping up the Beretta first because it was compact. It's a front wheel drive car. I need to be able to see and I need to be able to effectively adapt this firewall into a firewall meant for a rear wheel drive car. So with the strut towers out of the way, I was able to actually see. And screw those struts anyway. You can't get those things anyway. They're, they're, they don't exist. So like I was saying, with the strut towers out of the way on the Beretta, I was able to confirm all my measurements on the Blazer firewall. And that's when I started cutting it. And I cut it big just in case. I always cut big on the Blazer. Um, and what's kind of funny about this is when I went to go do the final cut, I missed a small portion on the inside of it. So I had to go inside of this thing for the final cut. And it opened up like a clamshell, kind of like what you see in the pictures. And it, it was just weird because I felt like I was being eaten by a giant clam. So there it is. The floor pan has been liberated from the Blazer. It's no longer going to be this SUV mom type vehicle. It's going to be some type of a weird four-wheel drive fast car. Besides needing to cut out the back of the Blazer in the future, which I can't explain right now. It won't make any sense. The Blazer is just basically a tool shed at this point where I put uh, basically all the junk metal. Uh, I'll put the, uh, the engine hoists in there. Just stuff that people aren't going to really take. 
And if they really are going to attempt to take that kind of stuff, I really hope they had a tennis shot. But it was never really a big issue because we live in a pretty cool neighborhood. All right, so things are getting easier at this point. Um, it, I have my two main objectives right next to each other, my two victims, and I don't have to you know, take four hours to move things. But it's getting harder at the same time because I'm actually having to be very detailed and very precise and very careful of the next cuts that I make. As you can see here, I've removed the floor pan out of the Beretta, um, but before doing that, I put in a cross structure that you can kind of barely see. This is the first test fit of the floor pan and firewall, and as I know, I know what you're thinking. As you can see, it it it, it doesn't look good. It's like, oof, good luck, but yeah, it works. It's all a little choppy at this point. Nothing really kind of fits. Uh, there's a lot more things I got to cut out. Um, the cross structure, as you can see in the picture, it needs to go up. I was also curious of whether or not I was going to be able to run some kind of a stock uh, heater AC unit in this, but it, it was pretty clear as soon as I put it in place, I looked at it, I was like, yeah, right, not going to happen, so it went in the trash, and I went to this little unit right here. However, this unit doesn't get installed until next year when I put the LS engine in. This particular area of the Beretta is uh, uh, an area I had to cut out. It's It's basically the frame of the car, and it comes in straight along the doors and then it goes towards the engine angles inward and I had to cut it out and this is something I actually want to mention about this area this is a 32 year old car with 225,000 miles on it this is why I love cars from Colorado because the inside of that tube has not been seen by sunlight whatever for the last 32 years it has no moisture in it no rust not even a sign of bubbling it is clean with how much I've torn this car apart, I've actually found documentation that has dated this car in Colorado, around the Colorado Springs area, basically its entire life. It is a true Colorado car. There are little brown marks, but it's not rust. It's actually burning seam seal for me going over this with a grinder. Moving on, I end up filling this area in with a piece of sheet metal that's about equal thickness with what's on the car currently. Um, and then I end up going over to the firewall and floor pan that I'm trying to install, and I trim it down a little bit more. I'm not going to lie, this is probably about the 10th time I've had this floor pan in and just test fitting it over and over and over and over and over again until I finally actually get this thing into a position where it looks pretty good and I tack it in place and leave it in the car. This is an interesting picture I kind of wanted to put into the film. It shows that the driver's side where everything goes through the firewall actually protrudes further than the passenger side. And this is the kind of thing... You, anybody needs to be concerned with if they're ever going to do something like this is that you need to be 10 steps ahead of every single cut no matter what if you don't you will end up with something that you can't work with after i started lightly going public with the pictures of this build there was a lot of people that were asking me like hey did you do anything with the frame to make this work and the answer is yes i had to move in two of the body mounts um right underneath the hinges of the doors I had to move those in exactly an inch on both sides, and then I had to actually shave down the very outside of the body mount to make this fit on the car. If I remember correctly, the Beretta from inner rocker to inner rocker is 52 inches, and from inner rocker to inner rocker on the Blazer was 54 inches. Here I go again, entertaining the neighborhood. I have to test fit the car. I've ha I have the floor pan tacked in place, and I have to basically test and see where I need to go from here. This time it's a little different though because I have the front clip of the car still on there and I'm not cutting that off. There's no way. In the back of my mind, I knew I was never going to get the front end lined up fender wise. It, it was just going to look like shit if I cut them off. So they are staying in place. I don't care. I know what you're thinking. This looks pretty sketchy, but I had no choice. I had to lean this thing and get that front clip over top of the engine. Me having to move the car like this actually gave me a sense of confidence in the structure because those bars up front on that front clip didn't even flex when I picked this car up. Definitely a warm and fuzzy. Hey everybody, look at my super cool toy car I just picked up from the store. What? It looks like a toy car. Shut up, I'm funny. Alright, this is where I'm basically confirming that I'm going to have to cut out the back of the blazer. Uh, the bar that you see going across is the gas tank cross member on the blazer frame. And the area up above where it's making contact is the sheet metal where the gas tank for the Beretta goes, which has been removed, 
but just above that is where you would sit in the back seat. Someone may be thinking, well, why didn't you just put in two cross structures, one in front, one in rear, cut out the entire bottom of the car, so you didn't have to have added complications? To answer that question, I wanted to leave as much of this car intact as I possibly could, and it was an issue of structural integrity as well. I am moving this car on two engine hoists, jerking it around. It's I was absolutely concerned about the doors shutting and closing correctly, the trunk shutting and closing correctly. I did not want to hack both front and rear out of this thing, almost eliminating all of its structural integrity before I knew for sure. And what I did is I actually cut out the rest of the car while it was over top of the frame with a fire blanket in place and then welded portions of the back of the blazer in place to put structure and structural integrity back into it without having to move the car abruptly back and forth. After I got the back structure welded in place, I took the car back off the frame, started cleaning up the frame. After I was done with that, I went back over to the car. I inspected all my welds, cleaned them up. Uh, put in some more welding, and this is the end result after paint and prime and interior. Moving on to the front, this is the area that I was talking about from before where it protrudes further from driver's side to passenger side. So I welded up a filler panel and welded it in place. As for the rest of it, this is really the best picture I can find. I know this isn't the last one because I welded in little splash guards to block off the body mounts in the bottom two corners, but Either way, the best picture I can find to show how I manipulated the metal and make it work and weld it all together for a finished product. And of course, as soon as I'm trying to finish this all up, Mother Nature moves in for the last slap in the face. But I don't care. Built a TP, grabbed a beer, climbed in, and finished it out. This picture is after my final welds, adding in the splash guards to protect the body mounts, and then seam seal and primer. And I'm not going to lie, folks, between the belly of this car, the firewall, and the very back of it, I probably have about $600 worth of seam seal on this car. This is after paint and when I'm just about to put the car on for the last time. And the thing that sucks is that every time I pop the hood on this car, I see this seam sealer and it doesn't look good. I cannot wait until I have a shop to where I can really take apart this car and make everything look spectacular. But that's an issue for another time. Either way, voila! I did want this car as low as I could possibly get it to try to get it to a stock ride height, but the suspension will more than likely take care of that. I said to myself, keep it simple, stupid. Put this car at its factory frame exposure and just, just don't overwhelm yourself because there are so many more other moving parts. And this is a factory Blazer's frame exposure, and I think I got it about a half an inch lower. So with the entire car... The floorboard has been raised up about six inches. The floorboard on the Beretta is, is recessed, and on the Blazer, it's actually raised up six inches. So I had to basically make my own seats. I started with the driver's seat, dissecting it, and added in bolsters, and basically customized it to me. Afterwards, I took the fabric, stuck it in the washing machine, and put it back together, and mwah! Fresh and clean, old-school seat, customized specifically for me. Next thing I had to do is trim up the fender wells on the car. The thing I want people to understand is that I knew that the Blazer had a longer wheelbase than the Beretta. However, it's a cheap car, and it was going to keep everything completely Chevy with a whole new smorgasbord of parts. On this car, a lot of people may not know this, but the rear radius of one fender well is not matching to the front radius. So what I did is I took a piece of cardboard and then matched the rear radius to the front radius, gave it a cut, and that was it. So some of the last fabrication that I need to do for this project is going to be between the brake pedal and the steering column. The brake pedal I already have figured out. However, I need to remove the last bits of wiring harness off the Blazer steering column. And that's where it happened. I figure I'm about two weeks away from driving this crazy Frankenstein project down the road, and I was trying to make quick work out of removing the ignition system off of the steering column, and that's when I pulled on a wire and it ripped out a spring-loaded component from the steering wheel hub, and it went straight into my right eye, puncturing my cornea. The lucky thing for me is that my girlfriend's an ER nurse. She literally watched the entire situation and she suspected that I gave myself a hyphema. So she ended up reaching out to a doctor that she worked with in the past. And what her contact said is go to the ER right now. The ER is not going to be able to do anything for you. But what they're going to do is give you referrals so you can get immediate attention. 
And we did exactly that because I lost all clear vision out of my right eye. So about eight hours later, I go into the eye doctor and they basically say, you need to have surgery on your eye right now. Otherwise, you're going to lose it. Besides going to Afghanistan when I was in the military, this is the scariest news I've ever had in my life. And it was so upsetting at the time because I have been doing so many stupid things, picking up cars, using probably $300 worth of cutting wheels, welding over gas tanks between a fire blanket. Is this really going to be the thing that stops me? My girlfriend took me out to dinner after the surgery. I'm extremely stressed, high on pain meds. I just didn't even know what to say or even think. But do you think it stopped me? No. I was told six weeks of light duty. I went one week before I got so bored I could not help myself but to continue. Push me and then just touch me till I can get my satisfaction. Push me and then just hurt me. But not to worry. This is actually three months after my eye injury where I got out of the doctor's office and they confirmed I have 20-20 vision. Made a complete recovery and if it wasn't for my girlfriend's quick reaction, I probably would have literally lost my eye. But I did actually pace myself for quite some time and let my eyeball heal. And in the meantime, I just stayed in the house and worked on simple stuff. The complete electrical harness of the Beretta is extremely easy to turn into a body harness because it's an 80s car. So that's what I did. And then I also did the finishing touches on the Blazer harness. Next thing you know, after some time, this Frankenstein is starting to come to life. Still got a lot of work I gotta do on this thing, but I can drive it now. So I went out and put that fine wax on her. <sighs> got two harnesses in this thing. So I need the key and that. This is my dog, Blake, folks. And besides the neighbors stopping by and seeing how I'm doing and talking about the project and rooting me on, he is my biggest fan. This little fella always wanted to be outside with me, and he never left the yard. He never left the proximity. There was occasions where he, you know, laid underneath my truck when the sun was out, but he always stayed by my side. And if I didn't let him outside, I would go inside the house and catch him doing this. I'm like, dude, how'd you even get in the window? So get, get down! And when he was outside, sometimes I would catch him doing something like this. And I'm really not sure what he's doing. Ah, but it doesn't matter. Because he's a good boy. Yes, he is. So here's the good thing about having a garbage motor hooked up to HP tuners in your project car. You get to practice things. Like a ghost cam. That's a 4.3 with a ghost cam. Didn't think that was possible. So after putzing this thing around for about a week, I said, screw it. I'm going to drive it to work. 160 miles. And yeah, I was going about 95 miles an hour. That 4.3 may not like it, but I don't care. After this trip is where I took pictures of this thing, and I sent it to the guy that I bought the blazer from. And then I thanked him for the beer. Anywho, I know there's going to be some people out there that are going to think that this is extremely creative, and they're going to dig it, and... They're going to be like, man, I'm super glad this guy shared this. This is awesome. And I appreciate that. But then there's going to be those people where they're going to be like, mm, Jeffrey, come look at this. This is absolutely preposterous. Look at this monstrosity of a build this simpleton has made. I am going to use my pinky extended as I dislike this video. Absolutely not acceptable. And to those people, well... Things that bother you never bother me I feel happy and fine Living in the sunlight, loving in the moonlight Having the wonderful time Having got a lot, I don't need a lot of coffee 
All right, folks, beyond this dust cloud is what you can expect for part two of this four-wheel drive, LS swapped, frame swapped, Chevy Beretta, completely done outside. <coughs> yep, that happened. Trust me, it wasn't because of my build quality. Also, the next donor on the chopping block, this super clean Chevy Tahoe, also known as the Taco. After that, details on how I crammed that LS into the Beretta. And then finally, the finished product. Well, maybe not really the finished product, because we know how project cars go. They're never really done. 